Hi, my name is Jennifer Cozart. I'm a cardiovascular surgeon here at THI, and I want to thank the perfusion department for inviting me to speak today. It's been my honor to work with so many THI perfusion staff members and trainees over the past 13 years I've been at Texas Heart, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to speak to you today. I'll be speaking about atrial fibrillation and the surgical management options of this common disease. Atrial fibrillation is the most common cardiac arrhythmia, affecting more than 33 million people uh, worldwide. In the U.S. alone, over 3 million people have AFib. Um, it's associated with increased risk of thromboembolic events like stroke and peripheral ischemia from embolus, uh, reduced quality of life, and also increased mortality. Persistent AFib is often a treatment challenge uh, due to the electrical and anatomic differences among patients. There can be variable scar burden, uh, different locations, and they can have left atrial enlargement as well as many other comorbidities. So what is AFib? Uh, AFib, or atrial fibrillation, is a supraventricular arrhythmia with chaotic rapid contraction of the atrium. On the EKG shown here on the top, uh, normal rhythm, uh, you see that there's, for every QRS complex, uh, it's preceded by a P wave at regular intervals. Below is a patient in AFib that has low amplitude baseline oscillations and fibrillatory or F waves uh, with an irregularly irregular ventricular rhythm. The F waves um, can have a rate of 300 to 600 beats per minute, and then the ventricular rate during AFib is typically 100 to 160 beats per minute. So this is kind of a busy slide, but it briefly shows that basically there's many different mechanisms of AFib, which is a heterogeneous disease, and it can have a variety of different electrical abnormalities. There can be single or multiple foci of abnormality, uh, multiple reentrant circuits or multiple wavelets. Uh, the majority of these abnormalities are found in the left atrium and near the pulmonary veins, but they can also arise in other areas of the heart. So there's several different um, types of AFib, and these are just some definitions. So an AFib episode is considered at least 30 seconds of AFib on an EKG tracing. Paroxysmal AFib is AFib that resolves within seven days of its onset. It's considered persistent if it continues beyond seven days. Um, and it's considered long-standing persistent AFib if it's continuous AFib for greater than 12 months. Um, AFib is the most common cardiac arrhythmia. As I said, it affects nearly 2% of the worldwide population. The incidence and prevalence increases with age, and patients 80 and above have an over 8% incidence. Uh, and men affect, are affected more than women. As I said, uh, AFib is less common in women, but when women experience AFib, they usually have many more symptoms, more complications, and a worse overall quality of life compared to men. There are many different causes uh, and risk factors for AFib, and some of those are included here, uh, like ischemic heart disease, acute myocardial infarction, uh, hypertension, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies, uh, also diabetes and hyperthyroidism. Obesity and sleep apnea are also causes, and temporary causes are alcohol and also post-op patients, uh, specifically after open heart or thoracic surgery. This is an important slide because it sums up most of everything we need to know about AFib. So the AFib risk factors shown here on the left are those that induce structural changes in the atrium, and then that leads to fibrosis of the tissue, uh, inflammation, and cellular changes in the atrium. These changes then increase the, sus the susceptibility to AFib. Persistent AFib then further induces electrical and structural remodeling, and that promotes more AFib. So the term AFib begets AFib is, very, um, is a very common thing you may hear uh, because the longer people are in AFib, then the more likely they're to continue in AFib. Um, AFib also leads to development of many other risk factors uh, that then further um, damage to the atrium. And then finally, AFib is associated with several adverse clinical outcomes, which we're all you know, familiar with, specifically stroke, myocardial infarction, dementia, heart failure, and thromboembolism. AFib um, in clinically leads to decreased atrial output, ventricular tachycardia, decreased cardiac output, increased thrombus formation, and an increased stroke risk. Uh, and and it, AFib produces about 25% of all known stroke, and it also increases thromboembolism. 
Uh, common symptoms with AFib are shown in the picture with palpitations, shortness of breath, fatigue, uh, and decreased quality of life and decreased exercise tolerance. But some patients have no symptoms at all. So AFib uh, causes the atria to beat irregularly, which causes stasis of the blood in the atria and then formation of thrombus. The most common place of thrombus formation is in the left atrial appendage, uh, which is shown in this uh, picture. Uh, the clot can then embolize into the bloodstream, leaving the heart, and end up lodged in the cerebral circulation, causing a stroke. Um, AFib increases stroke risk on average fivefold. Um, the strokes that are caused by AFib are typically more severe than those not related to AFib, and AFib uh, increases mortality and linked to uh, sudden death. Uh, this is just an echo, uh, which shows the left atrial appendage there on the right of the screen and thrombus within it, and that's what we typically see on an echo. Now we'll get into the procedural treatments for AFib. Most procedures for AFib target treatment of the left atrial wall because it's a critical part of initiating and maintaining persistent AFib. Endocardial ablation is done by an AP cardiologist, and it is effective, but it's difficult for treating persistent and longstanding persistent AFib. Uh, patients can require repeat uh, ablations, and these can uh, you know, lead to complications like esophageal and phrenic nerve injury. The techniques I'll cover specifically uh, coming up are the surgical, surgical techniques, um, which they're invasive, uh, of course have a longer recovery versus uh, endocardial ablations. Uh, specifically, Cox maze uh, is the gold standard surgical treatment for AFib. It's technically challenging, can be complex, requires sternotomy and cardiopulmonary bypass. Other techniques, like the mini maze, is a mix of different approaches and lesions. Pulmonary vein isolation uh, is another technique, but it only treats part of the left atrial wall. The convergent procedure, or the hybrid approach to AFib, is a newer technique uh, where a multidisciplinary team with, in, with uh, EP cardiologists and surgeons uh, do a combination of endocardial and epicardial ablation, and this provi provides maximal treatment to the left atrial tissue. So surgical treatment of AFib was first performed over 25 years ago by Dr. James Cox in 1987 at Barnes Hospital in, in St. Louis. Since then, the full Cox maze lesion set has proved to be highly effective and result in a high cure rate for AFib. The maze pattern of lesions was chosen to prevent the multiple erratic impulses from propagating through the heart, but also of leaving behind the ability of activating both, a both atria by a normal sinus rhythm. This diagram shows what's called the cut and sew Cox maze three procedure. The Cox maze has changed in iterations through time and this is the third uh, uh, design uh, by Dr. Cox. And so this technique actually involved making multiple incisions in the right and left atria, um, which then when you sewed it back together formed a set of scars, which isolated the pulmonary veins, the posterior left atrium. Right atrial incisions are also made. And these le lesions are meant to direct the sinus impulse from the sinoatrial node to the AV node along a specified route. In theory, this allows coordinated electrical activation of the entire atrial myocardium. Um, this pattern shown, the Cox maze 3, was, the first use, was first used in April 1992 and served as a basis for all subsequent minimally invasive approaches, or the so-called Cox maze 4 procedure. Um, this is what's known as the Cox maze 4 technique. Uh, it, it basically goes along the same uh, type of lines that were done with the cut and sew Cox maze 3. Uh, but it uses a combination of alternate energy sources like bipolar radiofrequency and cryoablation to complete the full lesion set instead of all incisions. This makes for an easier, quicker, and safer operation with the same end goal um, instead of using all incisions. So the Cox Maze 4 replaces, as I said, most of the cut and sew Cox Maze 3 lesions with uh, radiofrequency or cryoablation. The images shown here um, uh, kind of go over what that looks like uh, in the operating room. So this can be performed with sternotomy uh, or also minimally invasive through a right mini thoracotomy. Um, the, uh, the diagrams show what you would see through a sternotomy. Uh, we would do bicable cannulation, use initially normal thermic cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, and then we could use a bipolar clamp uh, to isolate a cuff of left atrial tissue surrounding the right and left pulmonary veins, and that, that creates the pulmonary vein isolation lesion lines. Then 
the, you can cool the patient to 34 degrees Celsius and perform the right atrial lesions uh, while the heart's still beating uh, without an uh, aortic clamp. Then you could cool the patient down, uh, uh, apply the aortic clamp and arrest the heart to perform the left atrial lesions. Um, the left atrial appendage is also closed. This can be done from the inside of the heart with sutures uh, or also the outside of the heart through different techniques, which I'll go over. Uh, cryoablation or, or cryothermy uh, is an excellent energy source because you can use this near valves and also directly over the coronary sinus because it actually preserves the fibrous skeleton of the heart and maintains valve competency without damage. These pictures just show uh, the setup for a right mini thoracotomy. The Coxmaze 4 lesion set uh, can also be performed very well through a right mini thoracotomy using femoral uh, cannulation uh, for bypass. Uh, we use a lot more of the energy sources uh, with the bipolar radio frequency uh, clamp as well as uh, the cryoprobe. So Dr. Ralph uh, Daviano uh, et al. did a review of Cox Maze 3 and Cox Maze 4 studies in 2017, comparing these two treatments and their results for AFib. Uh, the Cox Maze 4 has similar results at one year, uh, but actually lower um, uh, freedom from AFib at five years compared to the Cox Maze 3. One um, explanation for this is the older studies with the Cox Maze 3, the cut and sew, I'm sorry, the cut and sew uh, basically didn't really have similar follow-up methods, and so uh, it was thought that uh, they may, um, you know, not have as accurate uh, results uh, for their endpoints. However, uh, both are still considered excellent treatment for AFib and still the gold standard. <clears throat> These are just some of the many energy sources that have been used for surgical ablation for the past 24, or for the past 20 years. Um, there are several uh, bipolar radio frequency clamps that are currently available and cryosurgical energy sources. Uh, the majority of these, like laser, micro microwave, uh, and unipolar radio frequency, are no longer used. Um, the cryosurgical probe has evolved from its original uh, Frigitronics cryo probe that was used back uh, as early as 1973. It utilizes um, nitrous oxide at negative uh, 60 degrees uh, centigrade, and uh, the probe is made of aluminum, so it's highly flexible to get into difficult areas and different difficult shapes to, to get um, uh, good contact with the endocardium. Pulmonary vein isolation is done using a bipolar radio frequency clamp, as you see here. Um, it, it can be used in minimal access surgery, even uh, 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 thoracoscopic surgery, or the open chest. Um, the maximum success rate with just pulmonary vein isolation alone is about 70%. Um, this can be used also during concomitant open heart surgery, like with valves or bypasses. This illustration just shows what it would look like through an open chest uh, with a patient on bypass. Use the clamp um, uh, and place it around the right and left uh, pulmonary veins uh, with a little cuff of uh, left atrial tissue to achieve complete pulmonary vein isolation. Um, so next I want to talk about um, what I'm most excited about, which is the newest um, treatment for AFib. It's called the convergent procedure or a hybrid approach to AFib. It's a collaborative effort with both electrophysiologists and cardiac surgeons. It's basically two separate procedures, uh, surgical endocardioablation of the left atrium by a surgeon and also catheter-directed endocardioablation of the left atrium. This can be done on the same day or even staged four to six weeks uh, between each procedure. Um, here we actually prefer um, delaying it at least four weeks to give the epicardial lesions time to heal and scar, which could lead to a more uh, accurate endocardial mapping and endocardial ablation for the second stage. So there's two, two targeted patient groups for the convergent ablation. Um, Long-standing persistent AFib, those that have had AFib for at least a year or more, and those with persistent atrial fibrillation who have had recurrence even after failed endocardial ablations. Uh, the contraindications to this are having prior cardiac surgery or mediastinal radiation um, and even pericarditis, which could you know, uh, lead to um, adhesions uh, or scarring around the heart, which might make it difficult or impossible to safely get to the left atrium for treatment. Um, these pictures just kind of show what we see uh, during the surgical part. 
We make a small sub-xiphoid pericardial window um, at, at the inferior portion of the, of the sternum, as you see on the left, and then we actually put a large trocar into that incision into the pericardium and that goes behind the uh, heart. This is what the uh, ablation probe looks like. It's called the Episense uh, coagulation device. It's made by Atricure. And um, it's three centimeters long. It has a coil um, that does the ablation and provides uh, radio frequency ablation energy uh, to the heart. The energy is directed directly towards the heart, so away from the esophagus, which makes this much safer. So this is a video which shows what the surgical part looks like. We make an incision at the base of the xiphoid, go under the sternum, access the pericardium through a pericardial window, and we put the trocar behind the heart. So this is the surgeon's view. We put a thoracoscope through this trocar, so we're actually looking at the back of the heart. We put the Episense device in, as you just saw, and that creates these uh, uh, ablation lines. And we do those sequentially, one right next to the other, until the entire left atrium is completely covered with, with ablation between the pulmonary veins. So approximately four to six weeks later, the endocardial ablation portion would, would occur, and that's done in the cath lab by EP cardiologists. They access the femoral vein, uh, go into the heart uh, through a transseptal approach, and then any gaps that they find uh, through the endocardial mapping, uh, they just touch up with endocardial ablation using either cryo or radiofrequency to complete the entire lesion set. Um, and basically when we want to um, create uh, complete isolation of the left atrium as well as uh, complete lesions around the pulmonary veins for complete isolation. So the convergent lesion set after it's finished uh, is shown with a, the blue areas uh, which are done by the epicardial and the red areas done by the endocardial ablations. So the goal is basically reducing the substrate that causes AFib. We want entire coverage of the left uh, posterior atrial wall. Uh, as well as isolation of the pulmonary veins. The complications uh, that we tip or typically worry about with both of these procedures is esophageal injury. Um, we use a temperature probe to monitor the esophageal temperature at all times. Uh, we also worry about per pericarditis or effusions uh, post-op or post-ablation, and we can help control this with steroids and also anti-inflammatories like colchicine uh, and indocin. Uh, one exciting thing is uh, we just uh, had our first um, prospective multi-center randomized clinical trial um, called the Converge trial, and this data was published just recently in March of 2021. And um, this basically looked at the convergent procedure, uh, and it showed that it had a superior effectiveness compared to endocardial ablation alone in patients with advanced AFib. Um, and it basically proved that a heart team approach, a collaboration with EP cardiologists and surgeons, uh, significantly helps to improve outcomes in patients with uh, difficult AFib. So uh, from the study, uh, it enrolled a total of 153 patients. These patients were randomized to each treatment arm and treated with either the hybrid convergent procedure versus endocardial catheter ablation alone. And the convergent procedure had superior effectiveness um, at 12 and 18 months. Uh, in the graph here, it shows that basically um, the hybrid convergent patients are shown in orange and the endocardial ablation patients are shown in blue. And um, the convergent had better um, freedom from, from AFib um, over endocardial ablation alone. And also, even if it didn't cause complete freedom from AFib, it caused at least a greater than 90% AFib uh, burden reduction in the majority of patients and, and many more compared to endocardial ablation. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, uh, how it changed uh, use of antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, and, and across the board, uh, it, it improved uh, either just uh, completely obliterating their need for antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, decreasing the need for increasing antiarrhythmics or adding extra drugs, uh, and, and uh, just overall showed much more improvement over endocardial ablation alone. And then also in the patients that got convergent, um, uh, much uh, better results there with many less patients requiring cardioversion uh, within the 18-month period that was observed. 
Uh, this is, again, kind of a busy slide just showing many other studies that were done in the last 10 years looking at the convergent approach and um, uh, across the board looking at these um, basically uh, most patients at a year um, can uh, achieve sinus rhythm approximately 86 percent um, and we've also at our series here at Texas Heart uh, we've seen excellent results with freedom from AFib in approximately 95 percent of our patients at, at the six-month period. Whenever you're talking about AFib, um, H left atrial appendage management is also a very important part of, of uh, the overall treatment for AFib. We can also do this as a, uh, a standalone procedure uh, or even in addition to any kind of ablations. Um, as I said, when you're doing open heart surgery, you can do endocardial suture closure of the appendage uh, orifice. However, there's a high rate of failure, and so that's not done very often anymore. Uh, a lariat, which is an epicardial device, or a watchman endocardial device, those are usually done by EP cardiologists, and those have excellent results. Uh, surgically, on the right, uh, we use a device called the AtraClip, and that's a clip that's very easily and quickly placed at the base of the um, left atrial appendage, as shown on the right, um, and that helps not only uh, improve uh, reduction of AFib if there's any electrical signals arising from the, um, from the left atrial appendage itself, but also by closing that, it greatly reduces the risk of stroke in patients with AFib. Uh, just very briefly, when you close off the appendage, as I said, it can help reduce the arrhythmia burden, also reduce the risk of stroke and systolic thromboembolic problems. Uh, and so any, any patient with AFib, uh, closing off the appendage uh, is a very important part of their overall treatment, whether it's done alone or with another ablation procedure. So in summary, um, surgical treatment of AFib continues to be the most effective option for long-term freedom from AFib, especially uh, patients with very complex or long-standing persistent AFib. Uh, standalone or hybrid approaches offer excellent results, and treatment of AFib re remains an evolving field uh, with THI at the forefront of new therapies. Um, I actually do the convergent procedure here along with a group of uh, our excellent EP cardiologists uh, and uh, I'm really honored to, to have the ability to offer this to patients and uh, we're continuing to look at new therapies um, to treat patients like this in the future. And I just want to say thank you so much for having me talk today. Um, we love our perfusionists here at Texas Heart and I just want to say I appreciate all of you for helping us do our jobs every day. It's a pleasure working with you. Thank you.